Yeah, we're here for the Cape Epic. We're going to try and finish, but um, we'll try and finish this presentation first. Um, so it's, it's actually 1.30 in the morning in California, so I'm sorry if I fall asleep. That's why Phil's here. Um, he'll take over. So I, I work at Mesosphere. We're both engineers. Um, I've worked on a number of things. Uh, Phil works on Marathon. So what we're going to do today is take you through um, the Apache Mesos project, um, tell you a bit about Marathon, uh, show you a demo. This room is much larger than I imagined, so the demo is probably going to fail. So um, <laughs> I'll send you a link to a YouTube video afterwards. It's exponential, right? The more people, the, yeah, the lower the chance of that demo succeeding. Yeah. It's cool. Um, yeah, so how many people here have used Mesos or heard of it? OK, that's perfect, because uh, we're going to, yeah, that's great, because otherwise you'd find so many issues with our presentation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, let me motivate this uh, presentation by telling you a bit about the personas we have at Mesosphere. So um, this is something our um, design team, our user, user experience team came up with, um, uh, along with our product team. And um, we have a number of these. These are just two that I'm going to highlight for this presentation. And <clears throat> they're basically ways of uh, categorizing people who use and deploy applications to infrastructure. Um, so there's two here. We've got Dan, the data center operator, and Alice, the application developer. Um, and you know, strictly, they have very different responsibilities in any organization. Um, and Dan doesn't like getting um, woken up, but he gets woken up all the time, right? Because Alice deploys an application that breaks, and then he has to wake up and fix stuff. Um, otherwise, the website goes down, your service goes down, your customers uh, get angry and don't pay you money anymore. Um, and Dan loves automation because it makes his job much easier. He can reproduce issues. Um, he, can, you know, he has an audit trail, what happened when. Um, and he, you know, he really wants to control what's running in his data center. He wants a very high level, um, <clears throat> or very a low level understanding even, um, of everything that's running in, in the data center. Um, Alice, on the other hand, just wants to deploy her application. She doesn't really care about the process of getting things to production. Um, you know, it has to be done. It's you know, the, a necessity of developing an application. But um, really, she just wants her application to be on running on infrastructure as quickly as possible. She also doesn't like getting woken up. It happens less frequently, but you know, in, in a lot of organizations now, Alice is often on call too. Um, so there are three tenets that um, I think are important to understanding why uh, something like Mesos made it very easy for Twitter to scale um, to the size it did. So one of the interesting facts that um, I've heard over my time at Mesosphere, and I, I can't verify this, but I hear that um, on, at, any time, at any point in time, Twitter has maybe three people um, on call looking after their entire infrastructure. Uh, and they're running tens of thousands of nodes, um, you know, millions of users. So that's pretty awesome. And uh, software like Mesos basically helps that. Um, and how does it help that? So um, first, we have a clean separation of responsibilities. Um, people don't get woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, and there's easy programmatic deployment. So what do I mean by clean separation, right? So right now, you know, if you in install um, a web server somewhere, uh, Alice basically has to tell Dan how to configure a web server, right? It's like, this configuration file should be here. This is what the configuration file should um, contain. These are the dependencies you need to have installed on the server. And <clears throat> you know, it has to be this version of Linux, this version of um, PHP, you know, whatever else you're running. Um, that's painful, um, because every time a server goes down, Dan has to go in and recreate that node from scratch using this exact recipe that Alice has provided him. That's no good. Um, so in this new world, using Mesos and using containers, the goal is basically to ship your dependencies with your application. So Alice says, here's my Docker file. This is my, the image that specifies my application plus all the stuff that is needed to run it. And uh, Dan just runs that Docker file. He doesn't have to worry about it. Dan can then go and pull out the base operating system and install something new if he wants to. As long as it provides the same clean interface and can run Docker images, he doesn't care. Neither does Alice. Um, everything just keeps running, which is great. No more 3 o'clock. <laughs> wake-ups. Um, so you know, right now, as I mentioned, Dan gets woken up. Application goes down. Um, he gets woken up. Then he you know, escalates it to Alice. She gets woken up. Um, it's a bad situation all around. Um, Mesos Marathon can help you avoid this, because they basically automate the deployment of tasks. And if something fails, they'll keep it running. And Phil's going to go through a really uh, cool example later about how this actually works in practice. <coughs> OK, and um, programmatic deployment. So once you're using something like Mesos and Marathon, um, you can do lots of cool things. Like one, you can segregate all your developers from each other. So you can say, OK, uh, Alice 1 will have her instance of Marathon, um, which we'll talk more about later. Alice 2 will have her own instance of Marathon. Um, and then um, each one of those can deploy their applications to Marathon um, independently of each other. You don't need to you know, 
update your entire cluster every time someone wants to update their application. This makes Dan's life a lot easier because now the users are helping themselves instead of raising a ticket for him to deploy a new application every time they want a new, uh, new version of their application in production. Okay, so Mesos, like everything else in computer science, is just another layer of abstraction. So, um, you know, uh, we have this uh, archaic terminology. So we have these slaves, Mesos slaves, um, which run the uh, actual work. So these you can think of as actual nodes in your data center. So if you're a Twitter, for instance, this is not an actual figure, so don't quote me, but you may have 10,000 of these. Um, on top of that, you have this, this Mesos master, um, and you, know, you could have one or multiple of these, and I'll talk about high availability in a minute. Um, but essentially, this does all the coordination of work. So you know, the master is basically talking to all of the slaves and saying, okay, what resources do you have, um, and, what, and, and what can I run on you? Um, at the same time, it's talking to these things called coordinators, which are applications which have work to be run, and it's taking their work and running it on the mess of slaves. <coughs> so Apache Mesos is a cluster resource manager. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, I say it's straightforward. It, you can kind of understand it pretty easily, but there's a lot of work that's gone into making it very, very production ready. Um, so it's been used in uh, production for about three or four years now uh, at Twitter. And um, you know, there's a lot that you shouldn't take for granted, but it just works, and it's a great tool to use now if you're thinking of growing, you know, a large infrastructure. Um, so what it does is it aggregates resources and offers them to things we call schedulers. So schedulers are things that have work to be done. And Marathon, what, which is what Phil will talk about, is a scheduler. Um, Mesos then takes work from those schedulers and it launches tasks. Um, and then it communicates the state of those tasks back to you, the schedulers. So it's like your task has failed, your task has been lost, um, or your task is terminated. Maybe it's terminated perfectly normally. Um, it just communicates those exit codes back through a set of messages. And just to mot motivate this even more, um, these are all the people who use Mesos in production right now. So um, you know, Apple is the really interesting one here. Um, we actually we work with them a little bit, but. Um, Essentially, they looked at what was out there, and you know, they, they wanted something similar to what Google has, this thing called Borg. Um, and instead of writing their own, they chose to basically take the open source Apache project and use it for their own infrastructure, which is a great, great validation of the software. Um, Yelp does a really interesting thing, too, um, around continuous integration. So every time they deploy their website, it runs a series of uh, integration tests on Mesos using Amazon Spot instances. So this is really cool, because I think um, they, they use a 1,000 instances, spot instances, in parallel to run integration tests against every aspect of their website, um, which is wonderful because um, you know, it means every push is thoroughly tested and then gets pushed to production. OK, so let's talk about where Mesos came from. <coughs> so Mesos started off uh, as a student project, um, which, is, which is pretty cool. Um, so these were, uh, this was a class at UC Berkeley. Uh, I think it was CS262B. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, I didn't memorize that one. Um, and so I, I can't remember what the exact class is. It's something to do with advanced operating systems. Um, and Ben Heinemann and a few other students basically created this software to investigate clusters, cluster scheduling. Um, and the goal was to look into, so I, I spoke to one of the SREs at uh, the UC Berkeley Computer Science Lab, and he mentioned that one of the reasons they looked into this project was because they kept trying to run tests against some framework they were writing, some big data framework, and they had contention issues, right? Like, you know, you have some grad students and they have like a shared 100 node cluster and some people would try and run their application and take down someone else's application. And it would be really painful for everyone because there's weeks worth of work that would just be lost. Um, so they were like, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna solve this and create a new platform for sharing cluster resources. Um, so they took this to Twitter in um, 2010 and presented it. And um, you know, this led to a paper, a technical report being published later that year. Um, and then, um, you know, in 2000 and 10, it became an Apache project. Um, it entered the incubator, and then a few years later, in 2013, it, it actually graduated. So now it's a top-level Apache project, along with Hadoop and uh, Spark and all the rest. Um, so as I mentioned, it was basically created to investigate resource sharing so, um, and in a fine-grained way. So um, what, what do we mean by this? When you have um, any sort of uh, cluster, you basically want to allocate resources to users, right? So, you know, imagine you're running a supercomputer and you wanted some way of sharing um, what runs where. The very naive way of doing this is, say, do it on a per node basis, right? So you say, Phil gets 50 nodes, I get 50, that's fine. But what if Phil has more than 50 nodes worth of work, and what if I have less than 50 nodes worth of work? What if we both have more than 50 nodes worth of work? Who gets what? Um, and Mesos basically tried to tackle that using a, a, 
an algorithm called dominant resource fairness. Um, I'm not, uh, not going to go into that because there's a lot of maths and um, I'm not confident I could explain it well. But um, I recommend reading the paper. Um, it's, it's very well written. Um, there's actually a separate paper on this algorithm itself. Um, and yeah, that basically lets you share resources in a fair way across multiple dimensions, so CPU, memory, disk, uh, between these different applications. Um, at the same time, they had this vision of this data center operating system, um, which is our product, and I'll tell you a bit about that later. Um, but essentially, this idea of providing an abstraction of your data center. Um, so the way that works is, you know, if you think of your normal operating system provides a set of libraries and tools to let you run things across one computer, um, the idea of a data center operating system is to do that for your entire cluster. Okay, so this is what Mesos looks like. Um, so in the middle here, you have a series of Mesos masters. So here we're running three masters. So that means you can tolerate one node failing. Um, you need a majority of the nodes in your cluster to basically agree who's in charge. So if you lost two, for instance, your cluster would be in trouble. So production clusters typically run five. You know, if you've got a few hundred nodes, maybe you'll run five masters. Um, Twitter, I think, runs nine. Um, behind that, you have Zookeeper. Um, I won't go too much into what Zookeeper does, but essentially, Zookeeper is a way of um, figuring out who's in charge. So it does leader election, which is a known process, um, to basically work out which one of these three should be in charge. Um, on the top left, you have these things we call schedulers. So schedulers are things that do work. Um, so um, Marathon is one of those. Myriad is another one that's written up there. Um, these can be things like um, Spark, for instance. There's a Spark scheduler for Mesos. Um, there's a Jenkins scheduler, um, which I'll talk about later too, um, Kubernetes. So lots of different applications you can run on top of um, Mesos. At the bottom, you have the slave nodes. Um, and you'll notice that the slave nodes basically have these dotted white lines, which are probably quite hard to see. Um, those lines represent containers. So in Mesos land, you have Docker containers, which is what I think most people are familiar with. Who, who's used con Docker containers before here? Awesome. Cool. Um, so Mesos has uh, support for those. That's been there for like, I think, one and a half years now. Um, official support, unofficial support has been there for about two years. Um, it also supports something called Mesos containers, which the same things as Docker, maybe a bit less. Uh, we don't provide the image format, so you have to ship in all your own binaries. So you could say, OK, here's my JRE. This is why I want you to run my application in. It's a little bit more complicated, but it is lighter weight. Um, so you know, for instance, that's what Twitter uses um, and some of the other bigger customers who don't want to use Docker. Um, so each of these applications running on these message nodes is inside a container. Um, and then you know, we have a bunch of different applications all sharing the same resources. OK, so um, you know, the basic premise of Mesos is, base, is that the agents advertise resources. So agents, slaves, advertise resources to the master. The master takes these and offers them to a scheduler. Um, and it does this in a fair way, so that each scheduler gets a fair um, proportion of resources. The scheduler says, OK, um, I, I don't want those, or I, I want those. Um, in this case, it says I want them. Uh, the master communicates that task information down to the actual machine that's going to be doing the work. And then um, once that application is up and running, the agent reports the task status back to the master, and our application is running. Um, so one of the really interesting motivations for Mesos, um, I mentioned, is this idea of um, avoiding static partitioning. So static partitioning is this idea where you, know, you have three applications, um, you run three clusters for them. That's great, because you know that your application always runs on this machine, but it's notoriously inefficient. Um, you know, in this case, our applications have different load patterns, and at any point in the day, there's, there's a significant gap. You know, there's like uh, your Hadoop job may only run overnight. Your web server may see reduced load overnight. Um, why, why don't you just run those on the same cluster and benefit from increased utilization? Um, so you get this wonderful pattern. Um, and it's, it's kind of hard to visualize this using real data. But in practice, we found that people are able to double their utilization using something like Mesos, which is pretty compelling if you're, for instance, a Fortune 500 company and you want to save 30 or 40% on your spend um, for running your data center. Um, we have one customer who's managed to get up to 99% um, utilization, which is insane. Um, they actually have a really, really cool um, use case for Mesos, um, which is they're running simulation, financial simulations on it, and the best strategies get the most resources. But they're always able to, um, to, to use the same kind of workload to get that utilization really, really high. Um, that may not be practical for most people, and you may not want to do that if you're serving web traffic, because you know who knows that extra user might take down your cluster. But um, it, it's a cool idea. 
OK, so um, let's talk a bit about Twitter and why they found Mesos useful. Uh, so I mentioned in March 2010, um, Ben and a few of the other students gave a talk at Twitter, and they, said, and they presented their work. Um, and sitting in the audience were um, some engineers from Google who worked on Google's similar system called Borg. Um, so Borg is, it operates on cubes, I think. Uh, the Star Trek analogy is a bit fuzzy, but um, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it basically takes cubes and puts them around the uh, data center and places. It's very declarative. So you say, here's my application, here's how it should run, and then Google will go and run it on some resources for you. Um, and that's been running in production there for well over a decade, I think. Um, it's only around the, the late uh, 2000s that we started to hear about this because you know, it's Google's competitive advantage. And at Twitter at this time, I think they had 40 people, um, and they got you know, a handful of engineers to turn up to this meeting, and some of the engineers there were like, this is cool. This, this could be to us what Borg is for Google. Um, and uh, you know, basically keep, keep all of their microservices up and running for them without having to be on call all the time. And this was around the time that Twitter was running through all its scaling issues. So you know, 2010, I think, if you remember, Twitter went down uh, many, many times during the World Cup um, in 2010. Um, this was all around the same time. And this is when they started looking seriously at using Mesos. Um, cool. So Phil's going to tell us a bit about uh, using Marathon with Mesos in production. Uh, hi, everybody. I've been their silent partner so far, so let me. Let me come and, uh, come and stand here. Uh, yeah, so um, I know we've name-checked Marathon a couple of times. Uh, let me answer a question. Uh, what is Marathon? Um, so, uh, so Niles ran us through uh, Mesos, and uh, he, he said at one point uh, that Mesos is like everything in computer science and abstraction. It turns out that once you've already got a Mesos cluster, uh, what's really useful is more abstraction. Um, so <laughs> Marathon provides that for you. Um, so we, we've talked about marathon schedulers and uh, sorry, Mesos schedulers, and uh, you sometimes also hear them called frameworks, which is uh, already a kind of an overloaded term. So we prefer scheduler if we can. Um, we like to describe it as uh, init D for your data center, uh, which is kind of a, a nice way of, of thinking about it because it, it uh, what it effectively does is it runs uh, services or applications or however you want to describe those 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 tasks. Um, and it, it runs them, if they're, if they're a long-running thing like a web server, is, uh, is a good example. Um, it will run them, it will monitor them, and it will restart them when they fail or finish. Um, and uh, what I like to, to say particularly is that you can think of it as uh, your private platform as a service. Um, Sunil already stole one of my questions, which was who's using Docker, so we don't need to do that one again. But uh, is anyone using uh, platforms, uh, platforms as a service like Heroku or uh, Engine Yard or Nojitsu? OK, one or two. Uh, not too many people, which is kind of interesting, because this is ScaleConf. And what, what I found uh, when I started using these services was that uh, they're great. And you think this is amazing. It can, it can scale, you, you can scale this enormously, and then you do it, and you're like, oh my god, this is expensive. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> this was such a good idea when I wrote the architecture slide. <laughs> and now I'm sitting in a meeting explaining why my database costs are running at quite this. So um, Marathon kind of solves this problem for you. If you are a big company, uh, and you have a big cluster, or even if you're not, and you're thinking about uh, maybe starting one up, maybe using a provider like AWS, um, then Marathon uh, gives you the capability to run those services as if you were using one of those amazing services, but um, in-house on your own data center, and crucially, without huge amounts of configuration. So uh, this, is, uh, this is just a little GIF I put together. This kind of shows um, the, the UI, uh, which I work on a little bit. Um, it does stuff like scaling. Uh, you're reviewing. This is the sort of classic microservices pattern with the various servers and a, a front-end proxy. And uh, this is us deploying a Docker image. Pop in the, the Docker name, and it'll pull it down from Docker Hub or from your own private repository, if you like. Uh, so that's just a little demo of, of what it looks like. Uh, and that gives you a, a flavor of um, the, the sort of private platform as a service idea, um, because your developers get to see that. Uh, Sunil mentioned our, our personas of uh, Dan and uh, Alice, and Alice is very much who we've got in mind when we're developing Marathon. Um, the application developer wants to go in, create, uh, describe the, the environment in which the application should run, and then run it, scale it. All of this stuff should be transparent. Um, so we've got a cool, uh, a couple of, of uh, features which I'll just quickly run through. Obviously, you can run your apps on it. Um, it's highly available. Uh, there's uh, various options to run it in configurations with multiple master uh, nodes, um, and no single, obviously, uh, therefore, no single point of failure. 
Um, we support Docker natively. Uh, it's kind of worth saying that any task running on Mesos is, has some uh, level of containerization uh, via C groups. Um, but uh, obviously, Docker is in, so, uh, and Docker is incredibly useful. So we support Docker. Um, we have a web UI. We also have a REST API, which uh, we're going to show you uh, in action later. Um, which allows you to uh, start, scale, stop, the rest of it, all, all of those things on your jobs. Uh, and there's an event bus, and you can also, you can even run your own artifacts entirely through Marathon uh, by p putting them into HDFS and then uh, using them uh, when you start, start your apps. So you don't need to you know, push things in via S3 or some other form of static storage if you want to. Um, so, have an incredibly complicated state diagram. Uh, because it's got to that point in the morning. Uh, it's actually, uh, this, this, this describes the, the points of a deployment, and I thought, thought this was kind of cool um, because uh, Michael from, uh, in, in the first talk today, uh, was talking about uh, canary deployments. Um, and these, these are incredibly useful. Um, you, you, he, he described it way better than I could, so I won't repeat it, but um, uh, when you have a new version of your application, whether that's pushed automatically via continuous deployment from a new commit, um, or however, whatever change you're making there, um, you can just do that with a single uh, node. And um, If you're running things on Marathon, uh, you, you have uh, multiple instances of those applications, or you, you may very well. So you might have 100 running across, uh, packed via Mesos onto different nodes in your data center. Uh, you can just make that change on one of them and then monitor its health, and if that works, um, then you can go ahead and uh, deploy the rest. And you can do this automatically uh, using uh, Marathon's health checks and deployment strategies. Um, I won't dive right into that because uh, those uh, it's kind of a, a complicated um, subject, but those are very, very highly configurable. Um, and that means that rolling, deploy, and restart can happen automatically. You don't need to be sitting there clicking through the yes. It's done for you. Uh, but uh, Michael also said something else very interesting, which was that um, you know we're not a telco. We don't need Six Sigma availability. Uh, <laughs> What if you are a telco and you do need Six Sigma availability? Um, then you have to look at other deployment strategies, uh, which Marathon also will do for you. Um, so this, uh, this is Martin Fowler's uh, diagram of blue-green deployment. He wrote a really, really excellent uh, article on it, and it's worth checking out. Um, and uh, what you do with the blue-green deployment is you start up uh, another fully scaled set of applications um, with your new, uh, um, excuse me, new configuration and you check that that's all working. Um, so typically there is some sort of human interaction here that's not a fully automated process, although uh, technically it could be um, if you are confident enough in your automated testing. Um, and what's particularly cool about this is that having scaled, you've got 100 of your old instances, say, and 100 of your new instances, uh, you can run your full integration suite against your new instances before any of your customers are using them, and then you use, can use a load balancer to drain your traffic from your old to your new. And if at some point you start seeing unacceptable failures or uh, your monitoring server goes haywire, you can say, whoa, stop that. I've still got all my old configurations. I can drain my traffic back to those and keep them running and figure out what's going on with my new configuration. And this is, this is incredibly useful, particularly if you are sitting there sweating over a, uh, uh, a guarantee of uptime. <laughs> um, so that's. Uh, manual and automated testing, and that's another strategy that's uh, possible using Marathon. Um, so uh, these next few slides I like to think of as a digital flight book. Um, this is what's happening under the hood, uh, because we've put an abstraction on an abstraction here. Um, we have uh, Marathon is in communication with the master, and the master is in communication with its agents, and uh, a client, so that, that was a sort of, uh, that's an empty cluster. And now a client says, hey, I want to start an application on Marathon. Uh, with, uh, it's actually a, a post via the REST API here, um, which is just a, a simple JSON configuration. Um, that's, <laughs> that's exactly what I was just describing. There we go. And it's, it's, really, it's really very simple. Um, Marathon communicates that to the master. And uh, the master uh, launches a task on a slave. Uh, using, uh, because the, uh, the agents are communicating to the master what resources they have available. Um, then on the agent, an executor is started, and that starts a task, 
and the executor is uh, the, the sandbox that could be running Docker, that could be running a C groups app. Um, the state of that is communicated up to the master. Master communicates to Marathon, and Marathon via the UI or via whatever monitoring you put in place with the REST API keeps the client updated. And that's a, a sort of happy state. Uh, but things go wrong, and uh, <laughs> sometimes it even happens to me. <laughs> um, what happens in this case? Well, this is actually, this is the cool bit. Uh, because that's all being monitored by the agent. Uh, the agent says, hey, something went horribly wrong, uh, communicates that to the master, and uh, that's fine. Marathon simply communicates that it needs more resource. The master offers more resource, Marathon takes the resource, and the task is restarted. And that could be anywhere else on the data center. So maybe, maybe something caught fire, maybe uh, a power strip melted, uh, maybe you know, that node's just out. Or, or maybe you actually had a problem with your application, in which case you should probably check that. But um, that's, uh, uh, it, 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 your applications, even if they're failing once every 10 minutes, even if they're running out of memory, even if you have some, you know, critical architectural fault in, in your application, um, you can still run it. <laughs> uh, it'll just be popping up all over your data center. <laughs> um, so, uh, just, just a quick word on service discovery, uh, which is one of the sort of, I, I feel like it's, it's a thing we don't talk about enough. Um, uh, that's a problem if, you're, if your applications are being moved quickly around multiple nodes. Um, so, we have a couple of solutions to this. Uh, one of them is uh, Mesos DNS. Uh, Mesos DNS is kind of the neat, uh, really, really neat way of doing it, but um, I think I have a slide on it. Yes, I do. Marvelous. Um, each uh, task is, is um, notifies the DNS server uh, where it's running and on what port, and then it's just DNS. The only slight downside to it, there's a, there's a full uh, diagram of uh, everything that's happening there, um, but the slight downside is that uh, it needs SRV records, and that's not fully supported everywhere, um, which is hopefully soon. But um, So we have another option as well, which is uh, Marathon Load Balancer. Um, this runs, uh, actually, Marathon... It, it, the job runs on Marathon, uh, which generates a new HA proxy configuration uh, over a short uh, time period. Um, and this is pretty cool because uh, all you have to do to configure uh, your endpoint um, is place an environment variable in your uh, Marathon app description. Um, you say, I want you know, my app dot my domain dot com, and uh, HA proxy is updated with that every time your application moves. And that it does your load balancing as well. So if you have your 100 applications, uh, that's going to be routed correctly for you. Um, OK, uh, yeah, putting a Mesos cluster together. Um, this is one way of doing it. Uh, you need probably a chef or puppet or some similar configuration or a uh, CloudFormation um, template. And uh, you install Zookeeper, because Zookeeper is uh, pretty much essential to Mesos. You install Mesos, you install a scheduler, multiple schedulers, and then uh, you deploy your services. Uh, sounds simple, but can take a little while. Uh, but there is some excellent documentation on open.mesosphere.com. Uh, and then there's our way, uh, which is the DCOS, the Data Center Operating System. Um, where this is done for you, and then your packages uh, to install like Mesos, like Cassandra, like Kafka, uh, are also available for you to install very simply. And I would like to hand back to Sunil to talk a bit about those. Cool. Um, yeah, so um, I, I alluded to this in the beginning, but this idea of the data center operating system. Um, and basically, the way we see it is Mesos is pretty damn cool. Like, it does this cool task, task placement stuff. But as Phil mentioned, um, there's basically another abstraction relied on. Uh, you, you need to put something on top of it to basically make it useful to people who want to deploy applications. Um, so in our case, we basically have Mesos as what we call the data center kernel. It's the thing that takes work and puts it on resources. And then um, we have a bunch of services we build around it. So um, most of the components of uh, the big components of DCOS are open source, or soon will be. And um, essentially, this, this lets you basically install services very easily. Um, and we're going to show you that in a second. Um, so you can install things like Jenkins or uh, Kafka or Cassandra or Spark um, or Marathon very, very easily. Um, we also provide authentication features and all the rest of it. Um, what's interesting to note here in general, not just specific to, to us, is that people often ask, like, can I run Mesos uh, on my own hardware or does it have to be run in the cloud? Mesos is a cloud thing, right? Um, and actually, we, it doesn't really matter. Um, 
you get some nice things from running it on AWS, for instance. You know, if you want to auto-scale um, the group of uh, slaves you have, you can just keep increasing that. Um, alternatively, um, you know, a lot of people like to run it on their own hardware because it's a very easy way to get um, the same capabilities you'd get if you use something like Heroku but on your own hardware. Um, so very, very useful that way. Um, so this is a thing I currently work on, um, and I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, Jenkins is a pretty uh, painful product to use. Um, it, I, I think it hasn't really changed in 10 years. Um, <laughs> but um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's incredibly useful, right? Like, how many people here use Jenkins? Yeah, there's more people than use Docker, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and so, you know, there, there's some surveys that have been quoted where 70% 70 70 of developers and big corporations use Jenkins and 9% use Hudson, so they're also basically using Jenkins. Um, so <laughs> it's like, you know, four-fifths of people, developers use Jenkins, apparently, or in, in that set of uh, survey um, participants. But in any case, people use Jenkins, and it's painful. Like, uh, there, there are issues with it, but it's useful. Um, so we're trying to improve that by um, essentially reappropriating idea from PayPal. Um, and what they did was they use uh, this Mesos plugin for Jenkins. So that was, that was created at, at Twitter. Um, they, it was a hack day project. But PayPal really, PayPal slash eBay uh, took it and made it a production grade thing. Um, and what they do is they have this really weird model where they give every developer um, their own instance of Jenkins. Um, and this is in part to get around scaling issues with Jenkins, right? Um, if you've only got one team or one project using a Jenkins instance, then perhaps it won't fall over. Um, and so what they do is every developer gets their own Jenkins instance, but that would be really expensive if you had to give each one of those instances a build slave or multiple build slaves. So what they do is they actually use a Mesos cluster to pool those resources. So um, what happens here is when Jenkins has work to be done, it creates an agent on Mesos that runs a build. When that build is finished, the agent is um, torn down, and those resources are released to the rest of the cluster. So that's really cool because it lets them run, um, you know, several thousand builds um, on just le you know, on less than a hundred actual physical machines, which is really really efficient. Um, and then when you use that with something like Marathon or Kubernetes, you can easily do continuous de deployment. Um, and that's been a theme today, right? Continuous uh, integration, continuous delivery. Um, this is it, right? Um, this is very very easy to do as well um, when you're using something with an API like Kubernetes or Marathon. Um, so in this case, this is what I'm about to show you. We have a Git repo. Phil, um, who is the stick man down here, um, is about to push a change to the Git repo. Uh, Jenkins will build it, um, push it to Marathon. Oh, it will push a Docker Hub to a Docker image to Docker Hub. Then it'll push an application to Marathon. Marathon will update the running application with the latest change um, using the deployment mechanism he mentioned. Um, we don't have a load balancer set up because um, I'm hoping you're not all trying to access this website. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, we'll have a new application up and running. And I'm the other stick man here. So let's see um, what this looks like on this incredible resolution. So this is DCOS. Um, you can see I have an instance of Jenkins up and running, um, and uh, we have a marathon that comes with every instance of DCOS by default. Um, under the hood, this is actually running Mesos. So if, if, I, if we go back into open source land, um, you'll see this wonderful Mesos UI. Um, it's got fewer graphs than the DCOS UI, but you may like that. Um, so here we have this running application. That's the one I've deployed um, earlier. Um, and I'm going to, have you pushed your commit yet, Phil? Uh, I'm just trying to do it. The, the selfie is taking some time to upload. OK. <laughs> so um, <laughs> this is an application I deployed earlier um, just to try and mitigate some of the risk of this failing. Um, this is. Um, this is basically a Jekyll site, so it's a, it's a blog. Um, it's statically generated. I'll show you the repo, too, um, because we're at a tech conference, so you can, you can see my Git repo. Um, let's wait for that to load. Um, so um, this is our demo repo. Um, it's very, very simple. Um, it doesn't do anything too complicated. So all the Docker file is doing um, is two things. So if you haven't used Docker before, what I'm doing with this from statement is inheriting from a container that is um, or uh, made available by, by the Jekyll project itself, um, and then I'm adding my site to it. Um, when I build the container, um, which is what the CI system is going to do, uh, it will basically take this container, add the contents of the site directory to it, and then um, we have a, a new fully baked Docker image with my site in it. Um, and here we have the actual site. Um, and then what we also do is specify a marathon.json. So this is um, 
a definition of the site. So you saw a very, very simple, like, four fields version of that um, a few slides ago. This is a bit more complicated, but it's also very succinct. Um, if it wasn't JSON, it would probably be about 10 lines. Um, so, yeah, we have some interesting um, things to note here. Um, one is we specify the Docker image, um, but this is a placeholder latest. Um, so we're actually going to replace that with the git sha off the commit that Phil pushes. Um, it's pushed. OK, cool. Um, and then we specify a label too, so this is just a fixed thing. We're going to overwrite this too with um, whoever last changed the image. What we also specify is the number of instances we want to run. So, you know, one instance here. Um, if I wanted to run 100, I could put 100 here. Um, I could also scale it by the UI um, and the resources it requires, uh, memory and CPU. Um, we also specify a health check. So this tells, this is how Mesos does deployments. Um, it will launch a new version, wait for that health check, in this case a TCP one, um, to basically um, detect whether the application is up and running before it kills the old version. Um, cool. So let's go across to Jenkins and see what's happening. Let's see if it's picked up. Okay, so it's picked up Phil's change, which is great. Um, it's much less stressful. Um, so we have this uh, CD demo pipeline, um, which is using the cutting edge Jenkins build pipeline plugin, um, which you're about to see. Um, Yeah. Okay, so it failed. Um, <laughs> uh, what, what did you push? Uh, I, I pushed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I pushed the small, small change saying that there wasn't enough bandwidth to upload a selfie. Oh. Maybe that's why. Okay. Um, no, it looks like Docker failed. Um, so let's rerun that. Um, okay. I pushed another change shortly afterwards after I uploaded. Maybe that one will work. Oh, okay. Um, did you actually? Let's see. <laughs> okay. Rerun. Let's just rerun that. Yeah. Um, so if I show you what this build is doing, it's very, very simple. Um, uh, okay. So what we're doing here is we're basically logging into Docker Hub, we're building the image and tagging it with the git commit here. Pretty straightforward. And then we're pushing it with the git commit. Um, then what we do is we actually run um, this pipeline. So um, what's next after this step, um, assuming it finishes, is a test. So we run an integration test, but we actually run two containers. So one container is the one we've just built. We want to check that's working. And the way we check it's working is by running a second container that is actually using a link checker tool. Um, I think it's just called link checker. And um, that basically um, queries um, that the running web server and, and, tr and crawls the entire website and, and runs and essentially hits every one of those links to check if they're up. So this means if Phil had put a link into a website that didn't exist, this build would have failed, and the application would not have been deployed. So it looks like that run. Um, we're about to run the tests. So let's see what that does. Um, and while that's running, actually, um, it's going to take a few minutes. Um, I just thought I'd mention some of the other frameworks that are available on DCOS um, and for Mesos in general. Uh, DCOS just makes it really easy to install them. Um, OK, so Kubernetes is the other big one. So how many of you have heard of Kubernetes? OK, awesome. Um, so about as many as people who use Docker. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a fantastically rapidly moving project. Um, and so we basically provide a way to run Kubernetes on Mesos. So um, you know, one of the really interesting things about running um, Mesos is that you can run all these different types of applications on it um, at the same time as running Kubernetes. Um, this basically lets you provide the same as a as Dan, the data center operator, you, you don't want to run three clusters for, you know, like one for Hadoop, one for um, Spark, and one for your actual website. Um, you want to run everything on the same resources because that's how you get the most uh, efficiency benefit. Um, and so you know being able to provide Kubernetes as another one of these services that your developers can use is very, very valuable. Um, and so you know other things which are really interesting, Kafka, um, Kafka, even though it wasn't written for Mesos, I'm told by the guy who develops the framework that it feels like it was written for Mesos. Um, it, it integrates really nicely with Mesos. Um, we also allow you to run Yarn via a project we call Myriad. So anything that runs on Yarn, you can also run on, on Mesos. Um, and Kronos is another one that lets you run time scheduled jobs. Okay, let's see how this demo is doing. Did the build work? It's getting there. It's getting there, okay. Uh, let's look. OK, cool. So we're doing a bunch of Docker pulls. Um, so this is where the majority of, we're, we're pulling this over the Wi-Fi connection. I hope that's fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, it's, it's actually running on AWS, so it's OK. Um, 
what this is going to do once it's finished is uh, kick off a deployment in Marathon. Um, so Phil's going to show you a bit of the Marathon UI while that loads. <laughs> uh, I think I think we're uh, we're running short. Uh, oh, we short are. Time, okay. Sadly, sadly. Okay. Well, why don't we take some questions then? Um, yeah. If we have a few minutes. Um, while this finishes. And we have a bunch of business cards. We don't normally get to give these out, so um, <laughs> come, yeah. Uh, we didn't bring any stickers, but if you have a permanent marker, we can write Mesosphere on your laptop for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> cool. All right, uh, one at the front here. Thanks, that was a great overview. So at a previous job, we implemented something similar to this scheduler master-slave architecture, and we used HTTP to communicate between those components. And one of the problems we had was state getting inconsistent between the components. So the slave would think something is not running, but the scheduler thinks it is running, etc. Mm -hmm. How do those components communicate between each other, and how do you deal with ensuring state is consistent? Yeah, um, so that's a pretty key distributed systems uh, problem, I guess. Um, Mesos has it pretty well pinned, so we have um, a very consistent, well, a common reconciliation procedure between each of the nodes in the system. So, um, you know, that there are sometimes bugs. I think most of those have been worked out at Twitter, which is good for us. Um, but, um, yeah, essentially, we use protobufs to communicate between each of the components. We're moving towards HTTP. Um, each one of the components has a known reconciliation procedure. So if something goes online, it comes back online, it knows that it has to go to the master to get the state back. And the master is the thing that holds the like, global view of state. You can get some situations where there is failover between the masters where um, there is you know, perhaps a, a, a slight inconsistency. But in those situations, the tasks basically get reaped and restarted. Um, usually for people who are running long-running services, the failover happens so quickly that it shouldn't result in too much disruption to your workload. Um, but it's, it's reasonably well documented. Um, we can talk more about it afterwards if you like. Yeah. You've gone green. Yes, okay. Phil, do you <laughs> want to flip over to Marathon? Uh, yeah, yeah, let's do this. Okay. Right. So, uh, yeah, you might, might notice uh, we have a, a little label here, last change by Philip at Mesosphere. That's me. And uh, should, we, should we go in and look at it? Yeah, I think it's this one. This one here. Yeah. Refresh okay. It. That was that was the old state. Oh, hello from ScaleConf. And as soon, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Cool. All right. Um, yeah. Any more questions? Sh sh should we make yep. that slightly disturbing image go away first? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there we go. That's better. Cool. Um, so the previous question had to do with uh, connectivity between the services and the infrastructure. Uh, mine has more to do with the actual tasks that you bring up in uh, what Mesos infrastructure. So if I've got a, say, a multi-cluster data center, right, how do uh, my tasks communicate with each other? Does it mean that they're allocated, uh, what, writable IPs? And can I have multiple tasks like uh, running on the same pod on the same node? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, yeah, uh, so service service discovery is is difficult, and I we we did cover a couple of uh, possibilities um, for for having your your tasks talk to each other. Uh, virtual IPs uh, is something that's come into um, Mesos recently. Or mm -hmm. it's, well, actually, it's, they're not virtual; they're, they're genuine IP per container. Uh, so you have your own uh, NAT running within the data center. Mm -hmm. Um, By default, everything's given its own port. Um, so Mesos yeah. it, it itself port considers ports as another resource. So um, there'll be a range you allocate to Mesos when it starts. By default, I think it's like 10,000 to 20,000. And every time an uh, application is launched, it's given a port. So you can request you know, one to as many ports as you require. Mm -hmm. You can bind to those ports when you launch the application. And then it's up to you to use something like HAProxy using Marathon LB or another application to basically uh, translate globally known ports to whatever the application is actually running on. So um, yeah, it's, it's complicated. Uh, that's one of the, new, the pains of this new, um, you know, new reality we find ourselves in, because anything can run anywhere. Um, so you have to use something else to basically you know, map between what you know and what, what's actually run, running. So yeah, cool. Uh, Could you maybe clarify how does uh, Marathon and Mesos compared to Kubernetes, or I'm not, even after listening to a podcast and attending a, a workshop, I'm still unclear, are yeah, these yeah. two competing because they can work together? 
They, I mean, Absolutely. yeah, in some sense they are. Um, they do the same thing, right? Um, they just do it in different ways. Um, so one is the, the scale and, and um, production readiness, right? Like Mesos is six years old, seven years old now at this, time, at this point. Um, so that's pretty well tested. Marathon, I think, is on version 15? Uh, oh, yeah, 0 15. 16 just, it's just coming out? Yes. Um, uh, it's early access. So anyway, um, yeah, so that's been, you know, it's been used and tested in a bunch of places, which Kubernetes is just getting to that stage where people, it's, re it's stable enough for people to start using. Um, the other thing is scale. So um, Mesos is scaled to a cluster of 15,000 nodes. Marathon, I think, itself, what was the demo last week? 7,000 tasks? Yeah. Right? So they launched 7,000 tasks on a Marathon. Because I think Kubernetes will fall over about 100 or 200 machines. Um, that may suit your use case fine. Um, some of our customers have much, like, very large clusters. Um, the other thing is uh, resource isolation. So Kubernetes does not consider resources unless, by default, every application can use as many resources as it likes when it's run. Um, resources are basically, as we've mentioned multiple times, the like, basic tenet of Mes Mesos, right? You launch your application, you say, I want it to have this many resources. While that's a bit of a pain, because you have to work out how many resources your application requires, um, it's actually very useful because that's how you get those resource efficiencies, because then you can start bin packing individual nodes. So yeah, I mean, if I was, uh, Kubernetes is easy to set up. It's being rapidly developed. I'd, I'd, you know, I'd love to try it. Um, Mesos is just a bit further along that road, um, but I'm sure they'll all catch up eventually. So Worth mentioning there's a uh, Kubernetes um, f uh, framework yeah, so you could run Kubernetes on Mesos, as, yeah. well, as I mentioned, yeah. So. <laughs> Just to complicate yeah. things. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we've got time for one more question from the front, I think. Cool. cool this. Yeah, and come talk to us afterwards, we'll be here. Cool. Hi. Uh, how do you handle stateful application failover between nodes? For example, Jenkins is obviously very stateful, and yeah. when that single node dies, how do you handle that? That's a, yeah, that's a great question. Um, we basically, there are two approaches here. One is you use a network to file system. Um, so that's what we do for Jenkins. In this, in this case, we're not because it's a demo, but um, you know, for our own Jenkins cluster, we use a shared volume. Um, the other is that for applications like uh, Kafka and so on, um, we have uh, essentially, they, they maintain replication between nodes, but the scheduler for Kafka, for instance, which runs on Mesos, is aware of what's running where. So if one node goes down, then it, it knows that it should spin up another node somewhere else and start replicating data over to that. So that's really, really cool. Um, we also have some maintenance primitives coming in where you can basically tell the scheduler that this node is going away, move your data across, um, you know, give it a day or something, um, and your application keeps running. You maintain the same level of uh, uh, redundancy, um, and your data is safe. Um, but it is a difficult problem. Yeah. Cool. Thanks very much. Catch these guys afterwards if you have more questions. <laughs>